Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to Sister Wives with Mary Jane Kay. Today, I'll be giving my commentary on Sister Wives Season 6, Episode 3, Big Boy Panties. The episode opens with the Brown Wives and Cody meeting for my Sister Wives closet. Immediately, Robin bitches that it's not so easy starting a business. It's a lot of hard work, as if we don't already know that. And she says that all of them need to work together to make it work so that they can support themselves in the family. Robin is such a negative person. I don't feel that she works hard and she doesn't really take any accountability for her dream if she wants it to succeed. I don't see her taking a lot of responsibility for it failing or doing things to possibly change the progression of her business into something positive. She just seems to really blame her sister wives for not being as invested as she imagined they would be in her mind. And when the women fall short of Robin's vision board aspirations, she blames them for the failure of her dream. When this is her dream, she's a huge liability for the family, especially financially from the moment she got there. And it's not the fault of Robin's sister wives that her dream didn't work, that it didn't come to fruition. It's that Robin is lazy and she seems to have felt very entitled to her sister wives' time and effort to make her dream go. This is her passion. It's her dream. And the success or the inevitable failure of that dream is on Robin's shoulders. Robin's mistaken here, and no amount of effort her sister wives put in or didn't put in could change the trajectory of the business, the success of the business. When Robin's sister wives suggested that there possibly is a negative connotation in including sister wives in the business name, Robin totally ignored it. When they gave input on the designs, Robin ignored it. When they gave input that the prices were far too high, Robin ignored it. And then she blames her sister wives for her dream failing, that they didn't invest enough, when in reality, it's on Robin to make the necessary changes to her business to make her dream work. It's her passion. It's on her. At the meeting for my sister wife's closet, Christine reveals that she has took the initiative to make calls to have business t-shirts made, at least for marketing purposes. Christine says, you know, trying to balance her home life, her kids, the business of my sister wife's closet, possibly real estate too, that was just too much. So she decided a final decision to stop with the real estate stuff. She really wants to figure things out to try to make my sister wife's closet work. So Christine is taking the initiative. She really wants to get the My Sister Wives Closet logo out there for marketing purposes. And that's smart. Brand recognition is important. Now, Janelle disagrees. She doesn't think they've even reached the stage yet with the business to have the logo out there. She doesn't think the logo is even ready yet. Cody doesn't want to clutter the website with what he deems frumpy marketing pieces. Now, Christine is sitting right next to Cody as he's calling these things that Christine created frumpy marketing pieces. And Christine looks utterly humiliated as her husband is putting her down. She's covering her face. If Robin wants Janelle and Christine more involved, when they do work, when they do take the initiative to contribute, when they participate, if they are put down, if they're humiliated, how much more would they really be wanting to give if they aren't appreciated? Now, Cody complains about the frumpy, ugly marketing pieces Christine did as he is in one of the ugliest shirts I have ever seen myself. It's really interesting that Cody is calling Christine's marketing pieces frumpy and ugly with the way he's dressed. I really think maybe that was projection on his part. Now, Christine tells Cody she's done, she tried, and Cody tells her to not take it personally. It's just business. She shouldn't be taking anything personally. Christine explains to Cody that she would never want to put a frumpy t-shirt on their marketing Robin's business. She wouldn't want it to be frumpy. And again, Cody doubles down and he says it's frumpy. He is hell-bent on hurting her and putting her down. Christine makes a joke and she's laughing about it, trying to turn this into something light. But she says she really wants to see my sister wife's closet succeed. And she notes that Cody is really only wanting to market to a specific type of person. Cody disagrees. He says, no, that's not the case. He's marketing to everyone. 
Janelle is still going to pursue her plus size pieces for my sister wife's closet. And we learn Robin is meeting with a new manufacturer for her jewelry. It's a woman and her ex-husband. They work together and they manufacture together. And Cody, right off the bat, he's excited because he feels he and the ex-husband are going to have a lot to commiserate over working with all of these women. It's such a hardship. Robin jokes that they can do that or Cody can put his big boy panties on and just deal with it. You know, is that part of Robin's best customer service? Even Robin herself loves to emasculate Cody and be condescending. She probably calls Cody Kotex privately. Robin has Cody and panties more than once on this show. She always says, pull up those big boy panties, just like she told him on her honeymoon when she and Cody were having that conversation. They were talking, they were saying, we have decided to give them, the other wives, some of what they want. And at that point, Robin was telling Cody he needed to pull up his big boy panties. He needed to communicate with his wives. Now, everyone is laughing at Robin's joke about the big boy panties. But, you know, if Cody were really the alpha male he proclaims himself to be, I doubt he would just laugh it off and find it so funny. Cody asks if he can have his big boy panties so he can be in charge again. It's all smiles, ha ha, he he, everyone laughing. But if Cody's other wives joked with Cody like that in front of him in public, I guarantee he'd be butthurt, he'd be bitching and whining that he's the man, that he's the leader of this family, that it's a patriarchy, that he gets no respect. But notice, Robin, the favorite wife, can joke about Cody wearing his panties. This woman wrapped this man around her little finger, and now she is going to run him around to hell and back. She wears the pants, even at the time, back in Vegas. And Cody, the idiot, still thinks he's the hero. Janelle has conflicting opinions about my sister wife's closet. She is engaged when she realized she could express herself through the business. She started engaging more when she knew she could do the plus size line. But she worries about the financial viability and putting all of their eggs in one basket for the family and their income. She knows herself that she has other avenues that would be lucrative with making an actual secure, sure income. So Janelle is really considering if it's worth it. Janelle has a weigh-in date with her trainer, and the last few months, she really hasn't lost much weight. So this episode, she brought in her scale at her trainer's request, and she's going to destroy her scale. I loved watching that scene. I felt like it was very liberating for Janelle. Janelle does everything she can. She counts her calories daily. She works out daily. She hydrates. She stays away from sugar. So she really is frustrated, and she doesn't get why the weight loss isn't going faster, why the number on the scale specifically isn't going anywhere. Sean, Janelle's trainer, knows that Janelle really equates her weight loss journey specifically to the number on the scale. And he really wants to liberate her from that and say no more numbers. It's about successes and progress. So Sean wants Janelle to break the scale. And I remember I loved this scene the first time and I love it watching it again. Sean really wants Janelle to focus on the positives. Janelle really enjoyed breaking the scale, and she says she felt free. So Janelle knows she can run now. She's able to run for the first time since maybe elementary school. She feels stronger overall. She notices improved stamina. She has a lot more strength, and she knows she is really making progress. She feels it in herself and in her body and in her endurance. She just doesn't see the numbers she wants on the scale. So Sean is working with her to free her from that. So I really admire Janelle and how she progresses on her weight loss journey and she keeps to it and she stays on it. And we see her skinnier and skinnier and skinnier, losing more and more weight, progressing on her health journey, progressing on her weight loss journey as the seasons continue. And I admire that work ethic and that passion and that dedication. Next, we're back to the cul-de-sac saga. The Browns check out the building progress. There are driveways now. They're seeing a lot of progress. There are six weeks to Christmas and the kids are very invested in being in the homes by then. Also, Leo and Aspen are graduating soon, so the Browns really want to establish a true home base, especially for the older kids who are going off soon. 
Now, Janelle notices there was tile where there should be carpet in her home when they do the walkthrough. And Cody complains that Mona really doesn't let them have access to the builder. The builder is willing to do whatever they want because any changes affect the completion date for the homes. Of course, the more changes you make, the longer it's going to take for the completion date and they might not be in the homes by Christmas. And of course, the builder is going to make any changes you want. That's more money for them. Any changes you make where it's not their error and you're just changing your mind, they're making more money. It's more money in their pocket. So why would they say no? Of course he's saying yes. But if they really want to be in the homes by Christmas, they should stop with the changes. They should only be wanting to fix errors if there are errors from the builder's side, if that's really what they're truly invested in is being in this house by this date. Ona, the realtor, is really looking out for the Browns. If they keep repeating how important it is to be in the homes by Christmas, if that's truly their goal, they should really stop pestering the builder, stop showing up at the site, stop pestering Mona, stop making changes, if that's truly what's important to them and their priority. If I were Mona, I'd say, do what you want, do whatever you want, but do not expect to be in the homes by Christmas, and it's no longer my problem if you aren't in the homes. I'm not even going to try anymore. The Browns are adults. It's really on them to decide if they prefer to be in the homes by Christmas or if they want to delay that date of completion with changes. The builder's going to be happy to do whatever they want. He's going to be walking his happy ass to the bank either way. He would love if they make more changes. It's more money for him. He doesn't care. He doesn't care if they get in the homes by Christmas. So if this is important to the Browns, they know what to do to get in the homes at the appropriate time. Mona is really trying her best. She's going that extra step as a realtor. But if Cody really wants to be in the homes by Christmas, it's on him, it's on the wives to stop making changes if being in the homes by Christmas is really that important to them. Cody complains that there are so many opinions in the mix and everyone is indecisive. Janelle feels if they survive house building and they all still end up liking each other, then it'll be a good day. Mary walked into her home. She saw her wet bar for the first time and she fell in love. Robin has never been in a place that felt like home. And the further along they get with the house building process, it feels like this is where she is supposed to be. And the other wives, of course, feel the same. Cody is very excited about moving in. And Mona warns the Browns that they shouldn't do anything to jeopardize the loans yet because not everyone has been approved. Cody knows it's still a risk, but they live by faith and they hope to be in by Christmas. Of course, though, Mary and Robin still haven't gotten their paperwork through and their final approval. So at this point, things could have still fallen through. Cody knows it's a risk. He knows it's still not a sure thing, but he says they live by faith and they really hope to be in the homes by Christmas. Janelle says the family is changing in ways that they don't like, especially with the separation. So for her, her main goal, what she wants is to be in the homes. The family changed from the day Robin came around, in my opinion, and it continued to change until the functionality completely ceased to exist. Cody adds that they are busy, they're building the homes, they also hope to be in the homes in the next six weeks, and they're trying to also get my sister wife's closet off the ground to pay for the homes. Also, some of the kids are headed off to college, so they have that financial burden as well. Aspen and Leo are graduating, and McKelty is 16, but she is doing college classes through her high school program. So Cody worries about McKelty and he worries about her motivation and he wonders why she's doing this. Instead of being really proud of his daughter and seeing what a wonderful opportunity this is, he wonders if McKelty is just doing this because she wants bragging rights. He wonders if this is actually about her committing to her career. Christine adds that McKelty is the one child who keeps her up at night. She really worries about her. And a teenage McKelty says she can't wait to turn 18. She's going to get tattoos and piercings all over and she's going to move away. And of course, that's not what happened. Aspen and Maddie say McKelty is always perceived as the wild child, but it's all talk. Cody and Christine feel that they can use allowing McKelty to attend these college classes to keep her in line. They hold it over her head and they'll take it away if she's not behaving. 
And if she isn't good, she will have to go back to regular high school. Next, Cody and Leo and Mary are touring Westminster College in Utah. Leo really wants to go there. That is their number one school that they would like to attend. Cody is really sad that Leo is going away to college and Mary knows she's now going to be an empty nester and so it makes it much harder for her, Leo, going away. So Leo, Mary, and Cody drive all the way to Utah and they stop at their old home in Lehigh, their old stomping grounds, to see the home. Leo decided a while ago that they might live in the old house while they attend college. They're not sure yet, but they go to the house and the house felt odd. It felt foreign to them. It was different, especially for Mary. Mary says everything looked the same, but it felt different. It didn't feel like their home anymore. And Cody says he feels his home now is as weird as a three-legged dog. The house is as weird as a handicapped dog. Are handicapped animals weird? I felt that little comment, even if he meant nothing by it as a little joke, just shows the low level of empathy this man has. He said his house is as weird as a three-legged dog. And I know it's a figure of speech, but you know, if I think of a three-legged dog, my first thought would be, I want to protect the dog. I want to help the dog. Oh, my heart melts. I want to help. Not, oh, it's as weird, as odd as a three-legged dog. That wouldn't be my first thought. I know it was a figure of speech, but I really just think it shows the level of Cody's character. Cody says the soul of their home was their family. So the house in Lehigh now was a shell of a house. It was a house without the family's soul. Leo wanted to live in the house. And Cody says one of the reasons they didn't sell the home was because Leo always said they wanted to live there during college. I think one of the reasons they may not have sold it is how many polygamists are really looking for homes. Not many monogamous families are looking for one home with three separate apartments. And maybe it wasn't sold because no one would want it unless, of course, you're a polygamist. After visiting the home, Leo decides they might want to live in a dorm. They don't want to hold on to the past. They want to move forward. They want to move on with their life. And the home just didn't feel like home anymore. Cody now is thinking he might want to sell the house. He thinks the prospect of having the four homes in Vegas has made it easier for the family to let go of the home. It didn't feel like home anymore without them. So Leo, Mary, and Cody get to Westminster, and Cody mentions the concerns with them being FLDS, and he worries that there are some campuses who would not accept Leo because of their faith, because mainstream LDS aren't very accepting of the FLDS. So at Westminster, they don't discriminate. They like diversity. And Leo, at this point in the show, wanted to live plural marriage because God wants it for them. And they say they love their family and the relationship their moms have. So they want that too for themselves at this point in the show. And that's not how things turned out. But at this point, that's where Leo was headed. So Cody wants Leo to get a scholarship. And he really likes seeing Leo happy and he doesn't want to see Leo going into debt. They have a limited family budget for their kids going to college. And there are so many kids in the family. So Leo can only go to Westminster if she gets the scholarship. If not, they're SOL. So Leo, Mary, and Cody now are back in Vegas. And tomorrow, Logan is going to give his siblings a tour. And Cody is pressuring Leo to attend to even though Leo already has their heart set on Westminster. So Leo doesn't want to go, and they feel it's a ploy to get them going to UNLV. Cody insists it isn't, and he says he's sure Leo will attend Westminster. He already knows that. He just wants them to go on the tour because Aspen and Logan will be there, and he wants Leo to see another campus and be more open-minded. So Cody warns Leo that they have to go, that they have to take off their Westminster hoodie. They can't wear that sweatshirt on the UNLV tour. And he says, if they go and they wear the Westminster sweatshirt, he isn't going to be paying for any college. So he's just joking. But if you're touring a college, I don't really think it's offensive if you're wearing another university sweater or shirt. I wouldn't give a fuck. Leo tells her dad she doesn't want to go on this tour. She refuses to go there. And Cody wonders why Leo is being so stubborn. And Leo insists they want to go to Utah because of their friends, because of their church, because of their church community. So 
at this explanation, Cody says Leo doesn't have to go to the tour because they don't have their church in Vegas. They don't have their household of faith in Vegas. He knows that's Leo's priority. So he agrees that they don't have to go on the tour. Christine and Cody are taking Aspen and Logan is going to be the tour guide for UNLV. He works for admissions and Cody explains that Logan attends UNLV and he feels like Logan has left the family. He'll attend family stuff. He'll come around once in a while. And he says they used to have great talks. He used to have a really close relationship with Logan. But Logan and Cody don't really talk anymore. And he says Logan has a wall up now. He doesn't want to be bothered by his dad. That's how Cody feels about it. That Logan just doesn't want to be bothered. Aspen comments that Logan has taken leave into the extreme because he has a lot of pressure on him. Being the oldest in the family, there are 17 kids, so he took on a lot of responsibilities, and he has so many responsibilities. So he really took dropping those responsibilities to the extreme, and now he wants to be free, and he feels he can do whatever he wants to do. Logan says the family misses him. He knows that, and he misses them too. So he comes around every couple of weeks, but he is giving himself room to grow, room to mature, and he says he's spreading his wings and he's creating enough distance to be able to grow and mature. This is typical for kids who go away to college, and also Logan was parentified at a young age. He was very responsible for his siblings. He's also very wise. He has a lot of wisdom, and he looked after his siblings a lot. He's a very parentified figure in a very parentified role, getting the kids up for school, making them breakfast, doing this, doing that. So he had a lot of extra familial responsibilities in this plural family as the oldest son, as the first child that another teenager might not have. So I'm sure he's really appreciating his freedom at this time and the ability to really be selfish and learn who he is and enjoy life and really jump in the pool all the way. And I don't think he got that before. So I think he's really enjoying it. And I don't think that it's weird at all for him to want to be so independent. Cody adds that with them going public as a family, he was naive, and he really didn't realize the impact this would have on his children. If he truly understood the impact, I don't know if he'd be making the show anymore. If Cody could go back in hindsight, seeing all of the struggle his kids went through and his ex-wives went through and all of the turmoil and emotional hardships, especially the kids have gone through, going public, all for his ego, really. Would he think it was worth it to do this TV show? I would say no, but then again, I would never put my kids on TV for any cost, for any price, for any reason. Cody says everybody comes to a point in their life where they have to decide what they stand for. What does Cody stand for? He doesn't stand for his family. He doesn't stand for his ex-wives, the mothers of his kids. He doesn't stand for his kids. Cody really, truly only stands for his ego and himself, and maybe at times his favorite wife and her kids. In my opinion, he's selfish AF, and he will always be selfish as fuck. Cody doesn't even believe in polygamy anymore, and to remove the responsibility of the failure of his marriages and the implosion of his family from himself, from his own accountability, he will disparage polygamy itself which he once advocated for. He said that was the purpose of his show. And he puts down his own family, his ex-wives, his kids publicly all the time on the show. So what does Cody stand for other than his ego? Cody is only about himself and it shows. Cody doesn't think about how things affect his kids. He didn't think about the big picture and how this would affect his kids being a public family, being on television. The loss of anonymity. Cody points out that when the kids are out in the media and their children have been asked, are you going to live plural marriage? When Maddie answers no, she is applauded by the audience every time. But when Leo says yes, they don't necessarily boo, but it's silence. You could hear a pin drop. Logan reveals he doesn't want any pressure to be a part of the faith. And at this point, Logan hasn't addressed the issue of whether or not he's going to live polygamy. Now, we know, of course, Logan is a monogamist. He seems to be very happy in life. But at this point, he hasn't considered polygamy yet. And he isn't interested at this point in making a decision right now on it 
when he's back in college. He doesn't think college is the place to make that decision. So for the moment, Logan reveals he is living as though he doesn't intend to live plural marriage, but he hasn't made a final decision yet. All of Cody's kids so far are monogamous. The only kids I feel who might pursue polygamy might be the goblin spawn. Cody asks Aspen how she feels about what they have done in going public as a family, and he wonders how it has influenced Aspen and all the kids in the family. Aspen says she knows that there are challenges in plural marriage, and that is one of the reasons why she is unsure about pursuing plural marriage. She vacillates. She's not sure what she wants, but Aspen thinks it's like any marriage, plural marriage or monogamy, there are always challenges. Aspen ended up really liking UNLV, so she's going to attend and she wants to live on campus to have the full college experience. The girl wants to party. No one could blame her. Next up, the Browns are at an expo in Vegas for my sister wife's closet, and Robin thinks they will at least sell one piece in the first hour, but nothing has sold yet. And she says breaking that first sale will change the energy of the whole day. So at this expo, they had the fastest sale ever. It took 30 minutes. Gina, Robin's new manufacturer, is at the expo, and Robin reveals she put a new order in, and she had to bring a big check for Gina. My question is, why? Why waste money ordering more junk before they sell most of what they already have? That sounds foolish. So they're going to be ordering 100 pieces, and Robin wonders how to order, the right way to order, the right items to order, and she wonders if maybe she is spending too much. Ding, ding, ding. Maybe finally for once she's thinking in the right direction, wondering in the right direction. So Robin is hoping that this expo will be a success because the people in Vegas don't care about the Browns being polygamous the way that the people in Utah did. Some 80-year-old woman at the expo is all into Cody. She calls Cody a hunk. I think the girl needs glasses or hormones or maybe both. Wow. She, that old lady, really, really, really was into Kotex. Wow, wow, wow. She loved his six-pack abs, his great pecs. I guess beauty is in the eye of the beholder, or she needs glasses. Now, Christine claims how dead it is at the expo. There are no customers, so she really feels this is her last expo. It was boring. It was like watching paint dry. Very few people came in. And they only sold 18 pieces total all day that they spent there. And that is the lowest number of sales across all three expos. The problem isn't that people don't like the jewelry because they are polygamous. No one cares that they're polygamous. No one gives a flying fuck how you live or who you fuck or how you structure your family. A woman buying jewelry has to like the design. It has nothing to do with them being polygamous. The women who are potential customers have to like the designs. It has to be affordable. They don't care if Tom Cruise and George Clooney sat down and handcrafted these pieces. They don't give a fuck. The jewelry has to be eye-catching. It has to be designed well. It has to be affordable. I feel that Robin really overestimated that they are celebrities, that because they have some bullshit TV show on TLC, that these women, these viewers, would just gobble this jewelry up. They will gobble it up. Can't get it fast enough. They're flying off the shelves. No one will care that these people are on a reality show and that's their jewelry. That's not going to sell the pieces for them. It's about the pieces. It's about the price points. Their celebrity isn't going to sell a thing, and I feel Robin highly overestimated that. Robin says when they tour their homes, when they talk about their kids going to college, it inspires her to work hard on my sister wife's closet because she sees my sister wife's closet as something that will fund their lives and make it possible to give the family the money they need to make their lives successful and to take care of their kids. And that's what drives her every day. She works hard, she's so driven, and she knows they will make it work and that my sister wife's closet 
will be successful. She says she sees the end result in her head and she sees them having a viable business with my sister wife's closet. She sees it funding their houses and their lives. And she also sees it helping their kids go to college. Wow, that's a tall order. This woman thinks she started the next De Beers or the next Tiffany & Co. Holy shit. She can't even pay off her Victoria's Secret debt. The family has to do it for her, but she hopes her business is going to provide X, Y, Z, blah, 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 and it's going to totally fund the family. She's living in a dream world, baby. I want some of what that woman's smoking. Robin is like a delusional witch. And as Robin is talking about how she hopes her business is going to, this grand thing, it's going to pay for the homes, it's going to pay for college, it's going to pay for the whole family. Janelle and Christine are looking at her in the confessional, talking this big talk like the nut job she is. They're looking at her like literally they see the screws loose in her mind. This is crazy. They're looking at her like she's as delusional as she is. At this point, all they are doing is investing in a sinkhole with my sister wise closet. And just because Robin envisions it in her mind and posts it on her vision board, it doesn't mean it will be a reality. To manifest something, to make something go that you envision, you have to work. And if Robin expected big things to come from my sister wife's closet, first she needed to get her head out of the clouds to think realistically. And then she had to make the changes needed to make things work for her business. She is losing the family tons of money. She's actively losing the family money with this business. And instead of wasting her time on vision boards and imagining that her dream business, her business that is failing in reality, will save the family, maybe she could have made the changes needed to see the business improve. And putting in that time and effort would have changed the course of her business. There were three failed expos. And that should tell Robin all she needs to know about the changes she needed to make to make her business work, rather than the empty words and the dreaming and the fantasy and the delusion and the vision boards. She really should have spent that time working and making changes to her business rather than blaming her sister wives for the failure of the business and waxing poetic of these big dreams of how she sees her business when it is successful and all what it could provide for the family. It's not about what could happen in the future. It's about with dealing with the reality of now. It's good to dream. It's great to dream. It's great to believe in yourself, but you have to work in reality and do hard work for the dream to come to fruition, for it to manifest. And Robin spends all her time dreaming and she spends very little time working in reality in the here and now. She has grand delusions, delusions of grandeur. Christine really tried to make an effort and Cody shot her down with the t-shirt idea. And Christine and Janelle have mentioned the designs, they've mentioned the prices, but this is Robin's dream. Ultimately, it's in Robin's hands to adapt and make changes based on the new info she gained from these three expos. She should have gathered a lot of information from experimenting at these expos and from the website and made changes to her business if she wants it to work. Less manifesting, more hands-on work. She is counting her chickens way before they hatch, thinking about all of what could be before she tackles what is. And that's not on her sister wives. Robin's bullshit lost this family a lot of income they desperately needed at this time, and that's on her. This is obviously a hobby business. It's obvious that it would never become so big as to even be a substantial part of the family's income, and that's the reality of it. You can dream all you want, but if you don't deal with reality and make the changes needed to make that dream a reality, it's never going to come to you. Next, Dr. Guido, a high school teacher, is over at the Browns' home to discuss some of the kids getting scholarships. Leo is going to Westminster, and they can't go if they don't get the scholarship. It won't be affordable. So Dr. Guido is helping them, and Cody knows college might potentially cost more for one mother's child than another mother's child. So the family feels that all the kids need to get the most advantages that they can. Of course, with a family of 20 plus, you're going to need scholarships, financial aid, this, that, and the other to be able to pay for this unless Cody wants his kids to be in a world of debt. 
Cody feels if the kids are applying for scholarships, if they're keeping their grades up, they're going to understand the cost of college and they will become invested in it. The wives and Cody meet for my sister wife's closet and we learn they didn't just sell 18 pieces. They sold a whopping 19 pieces of jewelry. That just makes a world of difference. And Robin reveals they made $736 in profit. Cody doubts Robin's numbers, and he asks her if she took out the cost of the jewelry, as if she's a village idiot. And Robin says, yeah, she subtracted the cost of the jewelry. She subtracted everything else. Janelle asks Robin if she is able to cover the expenses for her business now from the profit it generates alone. And Robin says that's what she's been doing. That's how she made this payment for the new pieces she ordered. So instead of that $736 maybe going towards her home, for example, or her debt, she put it into buying new jewelry, more jewelry, when they are having trouble selling what they already have. Now, Robin feels the expo was not so awesome, but they still made a profit, and she says it's a brand new business, and she knows businesses take up to two years to make a real profit. At this point, Janelle has had enough, and Janelle lets Robin know that she realized she's just spending a lot of time on something that really isn't making her any money at all. So she can no longer invest this kind of time in my sister wife's closet. She has to fully disengage to do something that will make her money, like her real estate, for example. The family desperately needs money at this point. Robin looks pissed. She looks constipated, and she tells Janelle it's weird that she says that because she looks at it like they are making money for the whole family. And Janelle says they will never make enough money, enough income to even pay the light bill at home. And she really wants to change her role. She wants to do less for my sister wife's closet because they need money. Janelle knows she's wasting her time. Cody backs Janelle. Cody says Janelle doesn't seem to engage in my sister wife's closet anyway. He's okay with it if she doesn't want to pursue it more. And Janelle says she's engaged. She's still going to do the plus size designs that are coming to the website. And Robin's bitching that she wants Janelle in the business. And she knows that Janelle has strengths that could bless the business. Or she knows she doesn't know her head from her ass. And Janelle is an educated, intelligent woman who can dance circles around her. And she wants Janelle to do all the legwork and all the heavy lifting and crunch all the numbers as she sits on her ass. Robin reveals that she has been frustrated frustrated with the level of investment her sister wives put in to her dream. She's tried to give her sister wives room to figure this out, to want to get invested. And with Janelle, when she is saying she doesn't want to do this, that she wants to do real estate, it really disappoints Robin. But Robin says the door will never be closed to Janelle if Janelle changes her mind. Why would Janelle waste her time? Why would she change her mind? On the other hand, Christine has decided to invest more in My Sister Wife's Closet. And she took the liberty of speaking to the manufacturer and she has some designs she came up with. And Christine admits she was never fully invested in My Sister Wife's Closet before she really wasn't invested, but she thought about it, she prayed on it, and then she started really thinking about her relationships with her sister wives. And that changed how she felt about participating more in my sister wife's closet. And Christine says it's Robin's dream. And so because Robin is her sister wife, she's going to support Robin in her dream from now on. Robin, of course, is thrilled. She felt like it was a big deal for her and the relationship with Christine for Christine to decide that she wants to support her dream more and be more invested. Robin says it makes her feel loved. And Robin is convinced that if they build this business and if they give the business time, the business could absolutely fund the family. Keep dreaming. In the near future, they don't have another expo planned. Cody wants to evaluate things more and Mary really wants to do research on the expos. And they're going to have another meeting for my sister wife's closet in a week. That does it for this episode. I'll be back next week for the next episode of My Sister Wives Rewatch, Sister Wives Season 6, Episode 4, Odd Wife Out. Thanks for listening. I'll see you soon. Bye.